Hi everyone, you've tuned in to NTI's Japan Real Estate Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again, and thank you for joining us today. In this episode, we're going to discuss a painful subject that's unfortunately synonymous with Japan. That subject is earthquakes and other natural disasters, such as tsunamis, which is the other most frequent one here in Japan, although not as frequent as landed earthquakes, fortunately. Now, Japan, as many of you know, sits right on top of one of the world's most active earthquake fault line systems, and in fact, often experiences earthquakes, large and small. One of the world's uh, worst natural disasters in the last few decades, the Tohoku earthquake and tsunami of 2011, has claimed almost 16,000 lives, with over 2,500 people still missing, which brings the number to almost 19,000 people dead or presumed dead and has also kicked off the Fukushima nuclear disaster, one of the world's worst nuclear spillages, which is unfortunately still an ongoing thing here. Tsunamis, which are huge ocean tidal waves, are triggered by offshore earthquakes, which happen under the surface of the sea. And these, coupled with normal earthquakes, account for some of the world's worst natural disasters in history, and these unfortunately often hit hardest in Asia. One of the first questions that we as Japanese portfolio managers often get asked is regarding the likelihood of these events and their effects on property investments, uh, insurance coverage, and so forth. So we thought it may be a good idea to answer these here on the podcast as well. So first and foremost, regarding the actual effects um, on the Japanese property market, for better and worse, Japan is well versed in responding to these types of disasters and has an extensive private and public-based infrastructure which involves the latest early warning, notification, and response technologies. Now, as far as prediction goes, earthquakes are still unfortunately notoriously unpredictable, so can only be detected a few seconds or at best a few minutes prior to the event. But all mobile phones issued in the country or connected to its cellular network will issue a loud chiming or shrilling warning signal in these cases, regardless of whether they've been silenced or not. All schools and other public facilities regularly perform earthquake response drills for students and employees, which include immediate damage prevention by taking shelter under desks, and donning of protective clothing and gear, evacuation, and so forth. As far as structures go, From a real estate property investment perspective, again, Japan has the world's most advanced earthquake resistance building standards exactly for this reason. And these building standards have over the years greatly prevented or reduced the death toll and potential damage to property from these events. The latest earthquake resistant building standard for reinforced concrete structures was introduced in 1981. And so far they've stood the test of time. Even older buildings can be brought up to speed by various methods, uh, such as renovating the exterior, introducing stronger and newer support beams, and even installing gigantic pendulums on building roofs to allow the building more sway in case of an earthquake. Since this sway is one of the most important factors in protecting structures from collapse in case of such an event. Generally speaking, The more rigid and unyielding the structure is, the more likely it is that large parts of it or even the entire structure will collapse when an earthquake hits. So while visiting tourists who are staying at top floors of hotels are often horribly uh, frightened by the amount of swaying that goes on at the top when an earthquake occurs, it's actually this exact swaying that prevents the building from collapsing in the vast majority of cases. As far as insurance coverage goes, All standard Japanese insurance policies for any type of home, whether it's an older type house or a small block of flats, a more modern reinforced concrete condominium structure, these are always covered by insurance, at least to some degree. In most cases, anywhere between 25% of the value of the property and all the way up to 50% of the value in case of a total loss of the property will be forthcoming from the insurance company and quite promptly as far as landlord insurance is concerned, and most tenants will also opt for their own personal insurance to cover them for any loss of damage to uh, property that they keep inside the uh, uh, condominium or the house or to themselves if they happen to be at the property at the time the earthquake hits. Tsunamis as well are covered by the earthquake clause of insurance policies since they're always caused by deep sea earthquakes. And also the higher in the building the property is, 
the less it is likely to be damaged by tsunamis, which is why many tenants and landlords prefer to go for higher floor units when choosing which properties to rent or buy. Additionally to this insurance coverage, the building's accumulated funds pool, uh, which is known in other countries as the sink fund pool, is used to cover the repairs and renovations required after these events to the structure and the common areas surrounding the structure or contained in it, such as the uh, lobby, the leading access roads, any garden which may be a uh, part of the property itself, balconies and so forth. Any government compensation which also exists in these cases would depend on the severity of the natural disaster and on any other available coverage and compensation. But government compensation, while it does exist, can take a long time, often several years, and it will always be allocated to those whose lives are directly affected by these events first. And property investors, other types of um, anybody benefiting financially, landlords are last on the list for these payouts. There is unfortunately no clear way to predict where earthquakes will hit next. So when asked, we can't really tell clients or potential clients where would be the safest place in Japan to purchase. We do know, however, that some areas are more prone to these disasters than others. Tokyo, for instance, has long been hailed as one of the areas where a big earthquake will most likely hit in the next few decades. Fukui Prefecture, north of Kyoto and Nagano, also lies on one of the more active fault lines in the country. Ironically, it also has one of the largest concentrations of nuclear power plants in Japan, which is obviously not a good combination, as the 2011 events have shown us, so it may be best to avoid these areas. Having said that, um, Kumamoto City, for example, which is located in Japan's Kyushu landmass and not an area usually uh, considered to be earthquake-prone in the southeast, has also had a seven-magnitude quake as recently as 2016. And although the city escaped with relatively low damages compared to the potential of such a large quake, it may have been more a case of pure luck than anything else. So yes, to sum things up, Japan definitely experiences a large share of earthquakes compared with most other countries in the world, but it also has the capacity to respond to these events quickly and efficiently. And awareness uh, exists both from public and private institutions, local, national governments, insurance companies, support organizations. These all enable people to handle these events in the best possible way. As always in these cases, though, the main factor here, as scary as it may sound, is pure luck. And the combination of how damaging an earthquake can be to any particular property would also depend on how long that property has been generating positive rental income prior to the event itself. And fortunately, in Japan, that income is usually higher than in many other developed countries. So the bottom line does tend to remain positive, even when these events do occur. One could also claim that every country has its own set of potential risks when it comes to property investing. From bushfires in Australia, through potentially corrupt government or practitioners in other parts of Asia, crime rates in the USA. These are all things that we as property investors need to be aware of and come to terms with before choosing where to invest and how. And most importantly, as in all things related to investments of any kind, diversification and hedging across investment types, across asset classes, across geographical or socioeconomic profiles is the best insurance policy of all. That's it from us today. Do feel free to comment or message us directly if you'd like more information on this topic or any other topic related to Japan's real estate property investment market. We hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you haven't done so, please feel free to subscribe to our podcast and, of course, share it with your network. And until next time, happy investing.